on this episode of Assignment Discovery. See what happens when the oldest frozen mummy ever found is examined. In forensics, who killed the Iceman? Learn how his body was preserved and what it teaches us about how and where he lived. Scientists and archaeologists work together to reconstruct the last hours of the Iceman's life and the cause of his death. And watch for questions, activities, and resources after each segment. Consider this before viewing Forensics, Who Killed the Iceman, Part 1. Discuss what you know about forensic science from reading books and watching television and movies. Describe the techniques that help scientists draw accurate conclusions. As you watch the program, look for examples of how scientists apply these techniques to a prehistoric mystery. Assignment Discovery now presents Forensics, Who Killed the Iceman, Part 1. Ten thousand feet up in the Italian house, a life comes to an end. And a mystery begins. A mystery that will last five thousand years. Who was this man? How did he die? Today, investigators are giving the world's oldest detective story a brand new plot. We have found a very, very new spectacular discovery. And it was very painful for the Iceman. A series of remarkable new findings that may just revolutionize our understanding of those ancient times. For this is no normal death. This one still haunts scientists 50 centuries later. September 19th, 1991, a remote mountain on the border of Italy and Austria. For nearly two million days, the peak has been buried in snow. But this morning, freak weather conditions produce a remarkable thaw, and a corpse appears. Worried that the weather is turning, a local team begins to hack at the ice using ski poles and climbing gear. Slowly, a cadaver emerges. Surrounded by mysterious artifacts. All are rushed to the local police station. Only later does it dawn on them that this is not like other bodies. This strange corpse is one of the most important discoveries of the past century. The oldest human ever found. A man, 5,300 years old. With flesh and organs. Fingers and toes all intact. He is a specimen unique in the history of science. They will call him Utsi, the Iceman. Guarded by armed police, he is brought to his new home in 1998, a museum in Bolzano, Italy. Over the past decade, dozens of scientific teams around the world have been investigating this unique mummy. Learning more about his genes and bones, how he lived, what he ate, trying to put a face on him to understand who he once was. For 
However, this Iceman is the first human ever to walk out of the Stone Age and into our own time. The best link we have ever had to the world of our ancestors. Today, his caretaker is Dr. Edward Egarter. As forensic pathologist for the city of Bolzano, Egarter has spent his career unlocking the secrets of the dead. But the Iceman is a figure of special mystery. This mummy is so special because she is unique in the world. The mummy is like a, a man who died uh, one or two weeks ago. They've been preserving the Iceman with a special refrigeration system. As cold and moist as the glacier where he was found. Temperature, 21 degrees Fahrenheit. Relative humidity, nearly 100 percent. If they're taking such good care, there's a reason. Despite a decade of research, the key questions about the mummy have yet to be answered. Who was this man? Where did he come from? And how did he die? Okay, now we have to change the mummy. To get some answers, Egarter and an international team of scientists are contemplating a radical step. To do investigations in the body, you find eyes and you can't penetrate with the endoscopes. And so if you uh, need to take samples by the body, it's necessary to, to defrost him. To defrost the body. The dangers are immense. If a mistake is made, one of the great discoveries of our time could be irreparably damaged. But the potential rewards are great as well. At a gathering of the Scientific Oversight Committee, a debate begins, led by committee chairman Bruno Haas. They reach a daring decision. A team of forensic scientists will undertake the defrosting, and a garter will lead the team. I am a little bit anxious because it's uh, a little bit dangerous to defrost the mummy. The day arrives, and museum director Alex Susanna can only stand by and watch as a garter prepares. Inside an airlocked room, a race against the clock begins. For 5,300 years, this mummy has been an immortal, outside the grasp of time. But now, time prepares to claim him once again. For as the temperature rises, so too does the danger that microorganisms could begin to consume him. Dr. Friedrich Tiefenbrunner is an expert in microorganisms. The mummy is a big buffet for them. With their enzymes, they could decay the organic material of the mummy and destroy it in that way. And that's what we really fear. The team will have to move fast. We have not more than two hours. Any more time will be a risk for the mummy. To extract dental enamel, stomach samples, bone and tissue fragments for chemical analysis. Pieces that will be sent to scientists around the world to confirm their theories. Tiny gifts from the past. How did this Iceman survive so many years? How was he alone? so miraculously preserved. When most of us die, our body decomposes. Enzymes and bacteria break down the tissue until only bones remain. Mummies are different. They still have flesh, muscles, sometimes even hair. Most often, we have seen mummies as Egyptian nobles, carefully preserved for the ages by priests. But nature also has the power to mummify. Ice is one of the few forces that can stop decomposition. 
Ice mummies are extremely rare. Less than a dozen have been discovered in remote corners of the globe. The sailors of the Northwest Passage. The Empato Maiden of Peru. They show us that in ice, bacteria freeze, decay stops, and the body remains intact in a type of suspended animation. Still, ice crystals can damage the cell wall. But the Iceman is different, not just older, but truly unique. Because he wasn't just frozen, but freeze-dried, like coffee beans or vegetables. As the snows covered him, the dry, cold alpine winds actually drew the moisture from his corpse. Sucking more than 90% of the water right out of his body in a matter of weeks. The result is a remarkable level of preservation. The liquid gone, but the cell walls intact. Large parts of his body, down to the microscopic level, perfectly preserved. Now, this remarkable specimen is slowly beginning to defrost. The moisture, the smells, all speak of his re-emergence from the land of the dead. The garter checks the body carefully. The mummy is no longer a solid block of ice. A first sample is taken from his intestines, remnants of what he ate the day he died. It looks like dust, but it may be a crucial clue. The body is now so limp, it takes three men to turn him. Testing the flesh, they seem worried, for the temperature is slowly rising and time is short. Inside the defrosting room, the scientists are working faster now. As the temperature rises, they unclench the jaws, get past the tongue itself, and finally take their samples, dental enamel from deep within the mouth. For a garter, the key question is the most fundamental. What was the cause of death? How exactly did the Iceman die? Here on the very glacier where Utsi was found, two miles up in the Alps, the weather can change quickly. Storms rush in, disorienting even experienced climbers. In these conditions, it's easy to go astray, and it's not long until hypothermia sets in. Death by freezing. Back in the lab, the Iceman's body does show signs of an elevated temperature at death, a symptom of hypothermia. It also shows signs of fractured bones. Possible evidence that the Iceman might have fallen and cracked his ribs, laboring on until he could walk no more. But there are also other clues, clues that don't fit the theory. The Iceman's epidermis is gone, peeled off like a sock, leaving only a supple second layer of skin. His muscles, are partially decomposed. His body and hands show signs of wrinkling. Could these be the marks of another kind of death? Tired, disoriented, could the Iceman have stumbled into a glacial melt pool? Death by drowning. As the oxygen dwindled in his lungs, his nervous system shut down and darkness came to his brain.
Intriguing as they are, each of these scenarios has its flaws. And as the defrosting comes to an end, Agartha remains unconvinced by all of them. On one level, the work has been a success. They have gotten the samples they needed, and just in time. Any more and the body would have begun to decay. And yet they are still no closer to solving the essential mysteries of his death. The Garter decides to take a trip to Innsbruck, Austria, home of the world's largest archive of Iceman images. Now we want to study the X-ray pictures about the right side of the chest, because in this position there are rib fractures. At the University of Innsbruck, Professors Zerneden and Seidler examine the X-rays. Okay. So I think that's a, a fracture we don't know actually know. Was it before death or was it after death because of the ice pressure? But for a garter, the evidence of the fracture itself is inconclusive. Returning to Bolzano, he decides to take matters into his own hands. Under armed guard, he brings the mummy to make his own x-rays. New images, he hopes, will tell him more. As the first x-rays emerge, there's bad news. An odd black spot on the chest near the lungs. It might be the first sign of decomposition. Did the defrosting do more damage than they realized? A garter is worried. The next morning, he calls in an eminent local radiologist, Dr. Paul Gossner. The black spot turns out to be a false alarm. Focused on the chest, they almost don't notice a strange item in the upper left shoulder until Gossner's eye falls on a small, dark object. What is it? It's clearly not a part of the Iceman's anatomy. It must be some kind of foreign object. There's no way to tell for sure from the x-rays. They decide to bring the mummy to the hospital for a more high-tech approach, a CT scan. The trip isn't easy. On the way over, the mummy must be kept on ice the whole time. Inside the CT machine, it's scanned in a series of slices. In all, more than a thousand pictures. Assembled together in the computer, they can be rendered in three dimensions. As Gossner and Agarder watch anxiously, the first images take shape. A virtual Iceman. And then, something remarkable emerges in three dimensions. And this time, there's no doubt. It's an arrowhead. A flint arrow lodged in Utsi's back. The hole in the shoulder blade reveals the entry wound. For a garter and Gossner, it's an incredible find. We have found a very, very new spectacular discovery. We found a head of an arrow and uh, it was uh, completely new view in uh, uh, the story of the Iceman. Before a hastily assembled crowd of reporters from around the globe, Chairman Hosp lays out the news and introduces Egarter to present his remarkable finding. For all the scientists, like Professor Horst Seidler, it's just the beginning.
People which ask me, what are you doing 10 years and more with the Iceman? Now there's the answer. Let us continue. Uh, let us try uh, to get a little bit more information because of that new results. After a decade of study, a garter has made a major revelation. This discovery was a very, very new, spectacular discovery. The arrow penetrated the body from the left side behind and it was very painful for the Iceman. The Iceman is no longer simply a mummy. A fascinating piece of history for archaeologists. Now, he's a murder victim. And his tale is now the world's oldest detective story. The discovery of the arrowhead in the Iceman's back has changed everything. It's a whole new set of mysteries. How and why was Utzi shot? Agarder is trying to unravel the facts of the Iceman's death after 5,300 years. Alois Pierpommer was one of the mummy's original discoverers. Together, he and Agarder reconstruct the scene of the crime. But this investigation raises brand new questions. He noted when uh, he discovered the body that in the right hand the Iceman held a small knife. And that's the first time that they uh, heard it because in the past never it has been reported that. It's hinten auch bei man was das Circumstantial evidence or a key clue? For a garter, the case of the Iceman is getting more complicated. Now we know he died with a narrow in his back, but uh, we still don't know who might uh, have done it, and uh, we don't know where uh, exactly it happened and uh, how long it uh, took for him to die. We have so much to learn about his death. A violent death. A death in the mountains. Just imagine how hard it is to piece together the clues to a crime that's 5,300 years old. All we know is this. When death came for the Iceman, it came at 90 miles an hour, shot from a bow. was a remarkable shot, a perfect strike towards the heart and lungs, stopped less than an inch shy of its target, yet lethal all the same. Or was it? Now that you've seen Forensics, Who Killed the Iceman, Part 1, talk about this. Hikers in the Alps discovered a 5,300-year-old body in 1991. Why was the Iceman's body mummified? How did the scientists try to preserve the Iceman's remains while studying them? Why is this mummy scientifically significant? Now try this. Forensic pathologists used X-ray technology to study the Iceman. Research how x-rays are made and used in a hospital. What types of information do x-rays not reveal? For videos, CD-ROMs, lesson plans, and teacher resources on this topic and more, log on to discoveryschool.com. 
To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests Talking Bones, The Science of Forensic Anthropology by Peggy Thomas. Consider this before viewing Forensics, Who Killed the Iceman, Part 2. Why are the artifacts found with a mummy as important as the mummy itself? What limitations do the artifacts present in drawing conclusions about a mummy? As you watch the program, take note of how scientists use the Iceman's possessions to make inferences about his life. Assignment Discovery now presents Forensics, Who Killed the Iceman, Part 2. The Neolithic period is marked by tales of violence. Mass graves in Germany and Italy record the massacres of dozens of men and women. Wars, murders, all took their toll. But how exactly did Utzi die? To really know, we must do what forensic pathologists always do at the start of any investigation. Reconstruct the life of the victim. Who he was. How he lived. Today's scientists are able to do just that. Where did Itzi come from? North of the Alps, today's Austria? Or did he travel up from the south, today's Italy? The first clues are the work of two botanical scientists, Klaus Oeckel and Thomas Wilhelm. They believe that vegetation can tell us where the Iceman came from. Most probably, the Iceman walked through a valley like this and he passed through a vegetation like this 5,000 years ago. So, we are taking samples in the field from the characteristic vegetation of the area. And what we want to do is to compare it with uh, the pollen spectrum, which we find from the colon, to say precisely where he came from on his last journey. From the Iceman plants direct nebeneinander. The botanists have discovered the exact plants that made up the Iceman's bow and arrows. Here we have dogwoods, the arrow shaft is made of. And here we have the ash, uh, where we had the shaft of the dagger. Mm -hmm. This gives them the first broad proof of where the Iceman came from, right here in today's Italy. But can they narrow it down? Luckily, Uckel and Wilhelm have some new evidence. The sample Egarter and his team has given them from the defrosting. A tiny piece from the Iceman's stomach and intestines. One key finding allows them to get surprisingly precise. One of the most important plants we see over here, the hophorn bean tree. Large amounts of hophorn bean pollen were found in the sample from Utzi's stomach. This gives us the key of the place where he went off the last day of his life, because this species is only distributed south of the Alps. Millions of pollen cells from the hophorn bean plant would have flown through the air until they reached the wandering Iceman. These tiny cells floating on the wind now offer a definitive proof not just where Utsi came from. They can even tell us that he was here in the last 12 hours of his life. Once ingested, the pollen would move down through the throat and into the intestines at approximately three feet an hour. The pollen discovered in the Iceman traveled 27 feet in the intestines, meaning he must have passed through a hophorn beam region within his final six to twelve hours. Uh, 
Hirko and Wilhelm are excited about what they have found. For this 12-hour radius yields only one inhabited area. The Schnalstall Valley in northern Italy. So this tells us that most probably the Iceman started his last journey from this place over here in Katharinaberg. The area around Katharinaberg has been inhabited since the Stone Age. And now it seems clear that this is where Itzi set off from. We can even tell what time of year it would have been. While some believed Utsi died in the fall, right before the snows, Ickel now has proof it was actually in late spring, around June. For Utsi had within his stomach traces of many pollens, including the hophorn bean and the Swiss arola pine that only bloom in spring. And so on a June day, the Iceman would have started up the steep valley towards the Alpine peak on a rendezvous with his death. But for Edward Egarter, following the trail all these centuries later, the path is far from clear. Why would the Iceman have been killed? What were the circumstances of his death? The next phase of the mystery is about to begin. A death on a mountaintop. A shot in the back. But why did the Iceman die on this windy peak? As in any mystery, the answer may well lie in who he was. In Scotland, forensic pathologist Peter Vanessas has been trying to reconstruct the face of the Iceman. Starting with Utsi's skull, Vanessa uses computer software to calculate how layers of skin might lie on the bone and generate the features to reconstruct his visage, a digitized head. Then, using a police database often employed for murder victims, he completes the portrait, adding hair, opening the eyes and mouth, the distinguishing features of a face. We always look for something which will help us to identify a person, and that's why a gap in the teeth can be very important, as in this case here. And obviously, every time Otzi smiled uh, and spoke, this would be very noticeable to people. So that's how they would, that's one of the features that they would use to identify him. A gap in the teeth. This, of course, is just the beginning. There are many theories about Itzi's identity, many clues for Agarter at the Bolzano Museum, and not all of them come from the body. Some come from the items found with the Iceman at his death site, a remarkable copper axe that stunned scientists and forced them to revise estimates of when the Copper Age began in northern Italy 500 years earlier than originally suspected. A bow and arrows, strangely unfinished. A woven grass cloak and goatskin leggings. Each a clue. The Iceman's clothes tie in well with one of the most widely held theories, that Utsi was a shepherd driving the herds along the narrow alpine trails. If so, then his death could well have been a robbery murder, a killing for his most precious possession, his livestock. This theory makes a certain sense Shepherd still walked the very same path where the Iceman was found, at the very same time of year, just as they have for centuries. It's a yearly migration called the Transhumants. 
a journey to alpine pastures. Two anthropologists, Sylvia Reinhard and Hans Platzgumer, are eager to test out a theory. Along with archaeologist Anna Padrati, they want to discover whether or not Utsi could have been a shepherd by seeing whether his clothing would have made sense. Together they've crafted an exact duplicate of Utsi's clothes for Hans to wear. It's a brand new kind of archaeological experiment. No one has ever investigated how these clothes actually worked. Would they have been up to the arduous life of an alpine shepherd? Today, they will be put to the test in the transhumance. As Hans sets off up the mountain, Sylvia and Anna take the easy route, a helicopter. For Hans, following in the Iceman's path, it's a grueling 4,000-foot climb. A steep ascent over alpine switchbacks. From the mountaintop, Sylvia and Anna can clearly make out that Hans is having trouble. Modern-day sheep herders use shovels for footholds. Hans resorts to the Iceman's axe. Finally, he arrives, exhausted. Oh, Hans, here he is. Zeig mal her. His shoes were a disaster. They had no traction, and they didn't keep out the water at all. <laughs> but Hans also has good news to report. The cloak felt as warm as Gore-Tex. The mysterious unstrung bow became the perfect climbing staff, and the copper axe was indispensable. This experiment went very good because it's the first time that we had the idea that we use the bow and also the axe uh, for climbing up. And also we see that the shoes are totally broken and it's wet inside. And this is the result of the experiment that's very good. For the sheep, it was an easy climb up to their pastures just over the ridge. Yet for Hans, it was anything but especially with shoes so poorly suited to the task. For an older man, this would have been a hard way of life. Could Utsi have been something else instead? A brand new theory is starting to emerge. Forensics expert Franco Tagliaro believes that Utsi was not a shepherd or a trader, but a leader of his community. X-rays of Utsi show remarkably little degeneration of the joints, especially for a man in his 40s. There is no substantial evidence of any damage due or related to uh, intensive wear. Which leads Tagliaro and his team to wonder, how could this ice man have been a normal shepherd or hunter? his body would have undergone much more visible strain. On this basis, we feel that uh, it is more um, likely that uh, the subject uh, was uh, a leader in the community. If so, then perhaps the shooting arose over a fight in the village. Perhaps a dispute over a possession or even the leadership of the clan. Hunted without even realizing it. stumbled up the mountain to get away. Perhaps he was carried up in a special ceremony for a leader.
His corpse offers an intriguing piece of corroboration, for it is covered in tattoos, more than 59 in all. Some have speculated that these are the markings of a shaman, not a secular leader, but a religious one. Which leads to a last scenario. Archaeologist Johann Reinhardt has spent a lifetime wandering through the high peaks of the world. That's where he discovered five other ice mummies, and all of them were human sacrifices. Left to die on a mountaintop, could the Iceman have been a sacrificial victim too? Reinhardt points to several clues. First, his location. High in the mountains, in the shadow of the sacred Similaun Peak. Mountain cults were very important in the Bronze and Copper Age. Mountains were worshipped as gods because they were seen as controlling the weather and the water. Second, his objects. If Utsi was so mortally wounded, how did he take the time to lay out all his objects around him? Also, if the assault was a robbery or a murder, why didn't his assailant steal his possessions, especially his axe? It doesn't make sense, unless they were left there as a sign of respect for the sanctity of a leader or shaman. Four weeks after his discovery of the arrowhead, a garter returns to the University of Innsbruck, trying to nail down one last piece in the puzzle of the Iceman. There are several theories. But all are moot if he can't definitively prove the arrow was not just a wound, but a mortal wound, responsible for Itzi's death. Like any medical examiner, a garter is hunting for conclusive evidence. This step here in the Institute of Anatomy is uh, very important, uh, especially in the discovery of the cause of the death of the Iceman, because we have to make a comparison between the X-ray pictures and the anatomic reality of the body. A garter has come to one of the biggest centers in the world for the study of dead bodies, Innsbruck's Institute of Anatomy. It is a library of death, collected over a century. A garter's mission? To verify that the arrowhead actually killed Utzi. After all, since it didn't hit any major organs, the Iceman could have walked around with it for years in his back, until he finally died of old age. The upper back is a complex network of nerves and blood vessels, and Agarder needs to figure out exactly where the arrow hit. If the arrow cut an artery, the Iceman would have died within minutes. If it hit a vein, he'd have died within hours. A muscle, maybe not at all. Meanwhile, a garter's colleague, Dr. Paul Gossner, has managed to draw up a computer prototype of the problem using CAT scans to chart the exact trajectory of the arrowhead. First, Gossner scans in the body of a man the same size as Itzi. Then he focuses in on the blood vessels, the veins, and the arteries. Finally, he superimposes the body of the Iceman on this image. And as the picture comes into focus, Gossner and Egarter can now see exactly where the Iceman would have been hit with the arrow. The arrow is very close to the main artery that leads to the left arm. And it's possible that uh, uh, the artery has been cut by the head of the arrow. I am convinced that it becomes a very, very big uh, hemorrhage in this area and it's possible that that uh, will be the cause of the death. 
a garter's theory seems to be solid. But a computer model, no matter how ingenious, is not definitive proof. They'll have to go one step further. Late at night, after the tourists have all gone home, a garter and Gosner head into the museum to look for the proof. One last meeting with the mummy. A garter will re-explore an old clue. Examining Itsy's back the old-fashioned way with a magnifying glass. It's just a tiny incision, but it may hold the key to the mystery. Is it the entry wound? And did it heal or not? To inspect it, a garter will perform a mini defrosting. <laughs> Gently rubbing the wound with his fingers, a garter warms the flesh ever so slightly. Is there a scar or an open gash? Everything rides on this. With a tiny probe, a garter checks. There's no scar. It's the confirmation he was seeking. This is the proof we are looking for. This is where it, the arrow went in. The wound never healed. The Iceman's wound and his death were simultaneous, leaving only one verdict. Cause of death, a shot in the back. After 10 years, the case of Itzi, the Iceman, the world's oldest detective story, is solved. At least in part. Who can imagine what the last minutes of the Iceman were like? Who can guess what he was reaching for as he stretched out and died? the blood flowing from his wound. Could he or his fellow villagers have known that the frigid temperatures of that peak might preserve his body? Were they offering him a kind of immortality? For in a way, that is what the mountain granted him. A terrible death and a life beyond years. For he survives across the centuries, through the ages, he reaches up to us out of the icy past. Keep watching. Discussion topics and activity and resources for Forensics, Who Killed the Iceman, Part 2 are up next on Assignment Discovery. Now that you've seen Forensics, Who Killed the Iceman, Part 2, talk about this. DNA analysis of the contents of the Iceman's intestines indicated that he'd eaten ibex, red deer, cereal grains, and pollen. How did the pollen help solve the mystery of how he died? Now try this. Write a fictional account of the Iceman's last day of life. Explain why he was in the Alps, how he used his tools and weapons, and why he was alone. For videos, CD-ROMs, lesson plans, and teacher resources on this topic and more, log on to discoveryschool.com. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests Hidden Evidence by David Owen.